right, thank you. So let's take a show of hands. I want everybody to close their eyes. Okay, this is a, a group assessment exercise here. So close your eyes, raise your hand if you agree with the following statement, and then keep your hand up, okay? The statement is yes, antidepressants are effective medications. Raise your hand if you agree with that. Okay, now hold them there. Open your eyes and look around. Some people have their hands up. Actually, probably even most people don't. That kind of uncertainty, you can put your hands down, that kind of uncertainty about something as basic as does an antidepressant work is not something that is only restricted to this room. Experts around the world debate this very topic. For example, Peter Kramer listened to Prozac and heard a massive change in the treatment of psychiatric illness. And yet Irving Kirsch listened to Prozac and all he heard was placebo. That's a fundamental difference. Other people have com commented even more broadly, this goes way beyond depression and antidepressants, about psychiatry as a whole, saying we're out of our mind or unhinged. And some people have even recently argued that, you know what, we should just give up on this whole biological psychiatry thing altogether and stick to just the care of patients. But the problem is that this kind of approach of tearing down the field doesn't really solve the core problems. The core problems include the fact that with respect to prevalence, depression is the number one leading cause of disability worldwide. Sorry, with respect to disability. With respect to prevalence, 17% of adults in the U.S. take an, a, a, a psychiatric medication. Those are primarily uh, antidepressants. But even more strikingly, that number is up 65% in the past 15 years. And in terms of market size, psychiatric disorders are the biggest source of insurance spend in the United States more than any other organ system. So I think a big part of this is that we have not taken a serious, large-scale industrial look at how to use information about the brain to guide some basic assessments of our patients. And that's what I'm going to try to introduce you to. Today, psychiatric treatment works for roughly one in three patients. That's pretty low. Problem is, we don't even know who those one in three are. Our diagnoses are currently made based on clinical symptoms only, and there's no biological test for any aspect of diagnosis, prognosis, or treatment selection in psychiatry. As a consequence, you've heard about this from other speakers as well, medications and devices for the treatment of psychiatric conditions are developed in a one-size-fits-all approach uh, that just assumes that there's a thing called depression that merits a treatment called an antidepressant. These are the three things that we're going to be trying to address here, and addressing those will then impact the low response rate that's at the core of this problem. The problem is that studies with biology have in generally been small and using inconsistent methods. It's hard to actually aggregate knowledge based on that kind of information. The consequence of this is that the success rates for development of new drugs, and the same is true for device-based treatments in psychiatry, is lower than any other specialty. And this number doesn't even reflect genomics and immunotherapy and cancer. And yet other areas have figured out an approach, a solution that seems to work. Here what you see is the spend on precision medicines increasing steadily and then ramping up quickly uh, across uh, different areas of medicine, but really mostly at this point driven by oncology and antiviral treatment. Psychiatry has no presence on this whatsoever. So we have a choice. Thank you. I wasn't sure whether people would recognize that, but thank you. I appreciate that. We can take the blue pill, and we can stay where we are in this nihilistic perspective where we mostly tear down the field from within and outside, and just say, you know what? Our treatments work terribly. Everything needs to change wholesale. This is just a big problem. Maybe we just give up on biological psychiatry. Or we take the red pill and start with the fact that our diagnoses lack precision. Our diagnoses themselves need to change. Maybe we don't question whether antidepressants work. Maybe we question whether our current diagnosis of depression works, and maybe there's a better way to go about that. And 
recognized that unguided treatments, treatments that were not developed based on an understanding of what they're being developed for, will tend to work poorly. Our approach to addressing this is using EEG or electroencephalography to measure brain activity. You can see a EEG trace going by there in a video showing uh, the time lapse of EEG signal across the brain and you can, across the head. And you can see that there's all sorts of patterns in time and space that we can really make, uh, in, in really mine and, and make a lot of. EEG has the virtues that it is um, cheap, it's fast, it can be done at point of care in the clinic, and it's richly informative directly about brain function. However, EEG has seen its peak. There is this idea that EEG uh, has outlived its usefulness. But the reason for that, I think, is that EEG came at a time before we had sophisticated analytics and machine learning that are now de rigueur in the rest of, well, the world, really. So let me show you a little bit of data um, towards this effect. And this is work done in my lab with collaborators around the country. We took a study where we randomized a large group of depressed patients to um, either get the antidepressant drug Zoloft or sertraline or placebo, and found using a particular form of EEG connectivity that we've been developing out, that we can predict who will respond to the drug versus placebo. And you can see, especially in Reddit, towards the back of the brain, those were signals that predicted who will respond to drug versus placebo. But we could also see signals for what changes in the brain with the antidepressant. This is just after one week of treatment, you can already see a differentiation between drug and placebo in a different part of the brain towards the front. So there's a lot there to be born out of EEG. But the most interesting things, of course, come when you really apply machine learning and you develop machine learning approaches specifically tailored for EEG. And that's what we've been doing uh, for the last number of years, resulting in a set of brain signatures that we can map to treatment outcome in a variety of ways. So let me give you one example. Let's take that study, sertraline for depression. This is one part of that predictive pattern across the brain that is able to predict treatment outcome with very high accuracy. What you see plotted here on the x-axis is the actual clinical improvement patients had, and the y-axis is the clinical improvement predicted from the machine learning EEG uh, algorithm. If you take, this is just a snapshot of those findings, if you take this and say, what have we really learned doing this and how do we go forward, it gets very interesting. Let's take three random depressed patients. And this is not restricted to depression. We're working in PTSD and addiction and uh, a variety of areas. One of three respond really well to sertraline. I mean, much better, twice the rate of a placebo. But the other two thirds don't. In other words, a big, unselected clinical trial is really going to, max to, to, to try to get in with sort of non-directed means that one-third that responds, and that's going to drive the whole, uh, the whole trial. The interesting thing that has come out of this, though, is that our EEG markers are unrelated to symptoms. They are independent of how we do diagnoses, so they should translate across traditional diagnoses quite readily, and they work across EEG devices. In other words, it's a pattern that doesn't depend exactly on how you get it and record the data. What about these other uh, two people in this example? Well, at least some of them with the same sertraline signature seem to respond better to a particular form of brain stimulation and one particular protocol within the world of RTMS or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a form of non-invasive brain stimulation. And the other third, we're not quite sure yet, but those, uh, those, that work is developing, those ideas are growing. Using this kind of approach, one can think of trivially, you can guide clinical care with the tools that we have. And that's definitely an interest of ours. But even more importantly, you can drive the creation of new therapeutics with a neurotechnology platform that helps ground both pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions in a single, understandable, mechanistic framework um, that's driven really by biology at the individual level. So if you think of sertraline, the thing that we do right now for all of our patients, give them antidepressants, is treating the third, we're really hoping to find and treat those other two-thirds. To do that, we've taken the ideas, the tools, 
people from my lab at Stanford and now spun out a company called Alto Neuroscience where we're doing this at scale, going from the tens or hundreds even of subjects in typical academic studies to thousands of subjects uh, in uh, clinical studies that we can now do uh, on a much larger scale. And with the support of my chair, Laura Roberts, and the Neurosciences Institute, I'm taking leave from Stanford um, to run Alto and just can't wait to see what's out there and awaits us as we really push this to the max. Thank you.